Okay, I'm Joe Farrow. This is Geek Toolkit. One of the tools I want to talk about is a CNC machine, computer numerical control. Basically, it's, well, this here. And this is the MPCNC, the mostly printed CNC, designed by Ryan Zellers. He goes by the handle Alted, and his website is v1engineering.com. It's mostly printed because, well, most of the parts are 3D printed. All of these purple parts are printed. All of these white parts here are printed. I have the old foot style. It's constantly being revised to new ones, uh, or, well, new parts all, all around. But all of these are 3D printed, and then the conduit is electrical conduit. I'm using United States electrical conduit, which is uh, 3 quarter inch. It's 23.5 millimeters. So one of the first things about that I want to talk about this machine is when I went to go build it, I looked on the Thingiverse, found it there, there were three versions. And they all said 525, and then they had a 23.5, and they had an F and a C and a J, and I didn't understand what all this was. Here's the deal. Each region where you get conduit, there's going to be a different standard for the size. United States has a 23.5 millimeter, or three quarter inch, as I said, so you would get that if you're in the U.S., and you could acquire that conduit. If you're somewhere else in the world, you need to measure the conduit you can get a hold of, or if you're going to do steel bars, measure that. And then you just print the version. He has three different listings on Thingiverse. You print the version that matches the size conduit you need. The um, other thing about it is the 525, I believe, is his version number based on it was uh, May 20, what would that be? May 25th, 2016, that he did his major revision. The reason he does this is if you're going to do something like this extra vacuum foot here. If you're going to find that on Thingiverse, you can search for MPCNC and then the version of what you want, 525, and you'll find those parts. He does this because the entire machine is constantly getting revved. Well, I shouldn't say constantly. I guess it was 2016 in May for the last one, which is just over a year ago. But it does get revved here and there, and he wants to have a way of being able for people to get accessories and match it up. It makes sense. I think it's a really cool idea, a really cool system. And appreciate the work you must have to do to print three different parts or well, design three different parts so that he can take care of everywhere in the world. I'm going down a list real quick just to see what else is uh, that I want to talk about here. Okay, how does it work? Real quick, there's stepper motors. There's one on either side of each axis. So you see a stepper motor over there. And the stepper motor turns here. And that stepper motor, when it turns, it turns this belt. And that belt hooks in on either end. And that's, that pulls it. There's your X, there's your Y. I said those backwards, but you get the point. Here's Z. There's a stepper motor, turns this. And it makes your router or your spindle go up and down. Using a DeWalt 660, this is a 24 inch by 24 inch build. Your build size matters. If you go too big, you're gonna lose stability. If you lose stability, then you lose accuracy and you start hitting bigger issues. Same thing with height, height matters. I think I have a six inch build. If you go too high, then you lose stability. But if you go higher and you make it a 3D printer, you have a more efficient build. So. Things like PLA colors, the height, the size are all interchangeable. You can go with different spindles. You can go with lower speed, quieter spindles. Um, you can make this a 3D print head. You can make it a laser head. You can make it a pen. You can make it a drag knife. There's a lot of versatility of this machine. But you want to design it for what you think you're going to use it for. Okay, some of the gotchas I hit. The uh, first one I want to talk about is this right here. This is the zip tie holder. This holds the belt. This zip tie handles the tension, but the orientation of this holder is incredibly important. If you get this wrong and you have to redo it, it costs me about 45 minutes to redo. So make sure that these, you know, use photos or videos like this to make sure that orientation, that it points the right way. And I'll try to get you the, the one underneath it. Also has the flat portion of the back here. Another thing is if you're printing and you're using the, the parts from the kit, 
you don't need to print the pineapple pieces because this piece here will replace them. That is the z-axis and that, that screw there. You're going to want to use white lithium grease right about there to, and just basically put it on there and run it up and down. That will make your z-axis move smooth. It also will make it move easy enough that it won't skip. If you don't grease it, it will skip and you'll lose steps. And your Z, uh, when you do your carves, your depth won't be correct. The, if you're gonna do aluminum, there are people who have had success with aluminum. You're gonna wanna go a small, stiff build. I believe he recommended less than 16 inches. Uh, and a very short depth. If you go too high, you're going to have a lot less rigidity. Common question, a question I had is when you're going to print, pick up boards, there's a Rambo board and a Rambo Mini. The Rambo board has a bit more versatility and will allow you to get different firmware, which will allow you to do things like auto squaring the device, which means it would move this way. It would hit what's called an end stop, which is a switch there would be one on either side and when they both hit that it knows that this is square and it knows that it's at zero zero. That gives you the ability to do things like switch bits accurately or if the machine stops in, a, in the middle of a print, you can continue it. Or if you turn the machine off and wanna turn the machine back on, it can go find out where it is in XY location. If you don't do this, the machine is still usable and there's techniques, quite a few techniques actually to make it work. You would basically move to where you want to start your print. You set that as zero, zero, or you can set it as an offset. Basically, you're setting it where you want to start, and then it would go and carve your, your work piece. So there's techniques to, to handle both, but the dual firmware, if you want that, you're going to want the Rambo board. If you read up on v1engineering.com, he also has some other things talking about 3D printers, lasers, and uh, board selection, but that's the deal. If you hear about ramps, ramps was the older board. Rambo is the successor to ramps. Some things that you're gonna wanna print immediately, uh, drag chain. Drag chain is that wire organizer right there. They're very slick. Keep your wires nice and armored and organized. There's also one in the back there. A note about your wire orientation. This is how the wiring runs. It runs off a stepper motor through this pipe to the back of the machine. So make sure that you have your orientation and you know where to run your wires. If you run your wires the other way, you'd have wire coming out here. It would be in the front of the machine and that would be a pain if you're trying to load wood. So you really need your wire to go to the back and then pick a side. And then from that side, I pick the back left corner. You'll run out to your control board which is hiding back there. This vacuum hose is an attachment. Uh, you won't have that by default, but it's a, an upgrade. There's many of them. And there's some uh, decision making to, to do on that because you're adding, you're adding a bit of stress to the head. And you'll just want to evaluate, you know, if it's worth it, if you're worried about accuracy. I haven't had any problems, but I haven't done super accurate carves yet either. The other thing you'll want to print right off the bat with the drag chain are these. These are hold downs. These are basically uh, go into what's called your spoil board. Your spoil board is a board that you basically can toss away if you, you're going to basically be carving into it if you miss carves or anything or if you're going through. You might go into your spoil board. And so you're going to have this, you're going to have these things you're going to want to get. Something like these. Those screws, this is what it looks like before they're, they're put in there. And these are called threaded inserts. And basically what happens here is you drill a hole, you put your insert in, you screw it in until it's just below the level. And then inside of here, is a thread and that's how these bolts are mounted for this for the basically the hold downs these I got off Thingiverse this is one style there's a couple different ones 
this was the original size of that, but I wanted a, a bit beefier earlier, so I did bigger. This is another style. This style is nice because what happens is, say this was my wood piece or my work piece or what's called stock. I'm going to put this on top and then this holds it level and then I would just screw through here. So I have these here. It's got a curve on the back to help lock it in and it doesn't come over too much. These work really well because you can use them to hold the wood from the side or you can press it down or you can press it down this way or you can even put a piece of uh, a screw in the back here and there and the screw in the back can hold it level so you can still do very similar to this size here. If you find these or have these, this is another system, another way to do your spoil board and I'll do a different video on spoil boards. Basically this goes underneath. You'd put this under your wood and lock it in and then you would screw down from the top into the hole into this and that way it doesn't pop out. I didn't know that. I initially started out my spoil board by putting these on top and nailing it down and then trying to screw into it. This does two bad things. Number one is it makes your spoil board unlevel. So if you have your stock, you, your piece of wood ends up off, off um, well, it's, it's, it's not level, which is horrible when you're doing CNC. The other thing is it basically just rips out when you start screwing into it. So if you have that kind, you want to go in from below and lock it in. Okay, hopefully that gives you a good intro and some of the gotchas for assembly. I'm going to be doing other videos on things like this enclosure, which helps cut down noise and has things like uh, bits, bit holders. I'm going to talk about bits in a future video. And if you have questions or comments or things that you want to see me talk about more, let me know. And we'll do more videos and try to get the community helped out here. This was a very fun build. I was very intimidated when I first saw it. Honestly, if you can put something together from Ikea, you'd have no problem putting this together. Ryan's instructions are really straightforward. A lot of the community is helpful with videos like this. If you have questions, please put them on the forum. That seems to be where Ryan prefers them versus on Facebook. But there is a Facebook group for showing off your work and uh, trading some tips. And I'll do a video about software also later. That's a, another big question mark that I think a lot of people ask about. Thanks for watching. This is Joe Farrow from Geek Toolkit.